uh, with a colleague we wrote uh, uh, late in late 2021 uh, in December or um, and, and we published in, in January a piece which was actually about three scenarios of military escalation with uh, uh, of Russia against Ukraine and um, we had there a sort of moderate scenario where which just meant the basically recognition of the so-called DNR, LNR, the Lugansk and um, Donetsk so-called People's Republics. Then we had a sort of a medium a middle uh, scenario with a um, with a sort of medium escalation, perhaps in southern eastern Ukraine, and then we had also the sort of doomsday scenario of a major war of Russia against Ukraine, and that has now unfortunately materialized. Um, and uh, to a degree that I was frankly not expecting, especially this uh, frontal attack on Kiev um, and the idea that uh, Russia should actually change the Ukrainian leadership, should put in a puppet government, um, uh, and that, uh, you know, there would be like a, a major political change uh, as, a, as an aim of, of Russia. Um, and the reason that I did not expect that to happen in to this degree, although we had that, uh, as I mentioned in this scenario, I also published last summer in the National Interest, um, an article where, where I wrote that a, a major war is possible. Um, although, nevertheless, I did not expect that, and that was because I don't see an end game here for Putin. I don't see how he actually can implement this apparent plan that he had of storming um, Kiev, uh, perhaps catching Zelensky, and then put in some some puppet um, instead of uh, Zelensky, perhaps somebody like Yanukovych or Medvedchuk or some, somebody like that. So, because that does not work in Ukraine, you cannot do that. You can do it formally, but uh, you actually have to, in order to take um, Ukraine under control, you would have to have a huge occupation uh, force uh, with a basically terroristic op occupation regime, which would terrorize the, uh, the ordinary population into some sort of submission. And while Russia may have, uh, or uh, the Kremlin may have a desire to do so. It does not have the resources to do so for that. Uh, for something like that, Ukraine is, is simply too large. And uh, even if you, if uh, the Kremlin would just take, let's say, southern and eastern Ukraine and parts of central Ukraine, that would be still uh, too too much. And we've now seen that um, this uh, entire operation. Uh, is not materializing. The only major city that has been captured so far is Kherson. And even in Kherson, you have uh, demonstrations with Ukrainian flags, uh, which sort of illustrates the uh, the foolishness of this entire um, endeavor. So this is uh, comes as a real shock. And um, the problem here is now, um, as I see it, that there is an, uh, a really large and encouraging and touching, I would say, wave of sympathy, support, empathy, uh, also a lot of respect and uh, acknowledgement for Ukraine as a nation. Uh, I don't know how it's in Canada or North America, but in Germany it's huge actually. There are huge demonstrations. The newspapers are full with articles about Ukraine even the local newspapers. I've, I've read in the last uh, two weeks local newspapers in South, in South East Germany and in, in West Germany, in the north of West Germany where I'm currently. And I'm actually surprised how full and how detailed the, um, uh, the local newspapers even are reporting about Ukraine and uh, what, you, what Germany has been experienced in the last two weeks is a sort of crash course in Ukrainian studies about Ukrainian history, politics, society, culture, and so on. And that is all very encouraging and um, is very good. And Ukraine is now, you know, acknowledged here as a, 
um, as a fully European, I would say even heroically a Europe, European country and nation uh, and generates a lot of sympathy. And But the task remains to transform this sympathy and, and respect into more um, more substantial, more, more material action than we have so far. So we have, of course, some action. We have, uh, I, I'm now speaking here mainly about Germany because I know here the situation best. I was by accident, uh, I was when the war started in Germany, actually visiting my, my elderly parents uh, as I do every every month. And so I was basically stuck here. I, in a way, I would prefer to be now in Kiev where I, where I usually live. Um, Although now I'm also uh, reconsidering this sort of regret because I may have put my friends uh, and my neighbors in Kiev in danger. If I were there, I could have become a, a target perhaps for the so-called diversante. Anyway, um, the, um, uh, uh, the situation in Germany is such that uh, uh, there is a lot of sympathy and, and public support also for sanctions, for weapons deliveries which uh, was a month ago would have been very difficult to uh, to predict uh, to this degree uh, because you know then the majority of the population was still against weapon deliveries and um, the population was rather cautious concerning sanctions against Russia that has changed to uh, to a surprising degree we have now uh, large majorities for sanctions for weapons deliveries and even we have in the last opinion poll here a majority of voters being against the full uh, energy resources, energy um, import stop um, of Germany, of, uh, of imports from uh, Russia of, uh, of gas, oil and coal. And coal. So, um, so actually the, the population in a way is now more pro-Ukrainian than the government and the, um, and the parliament. Um, and that is in a way very, very encouraging, but so far that has not yet led to, I would say, sufficiently large German support for, for Ukraine. Uh, sanctions have been adopted uh, by the European Union with the support of, of Germany in many, in many uh, ways and many regards, a whole range of sanctions. Uh, and also Germany has started to uh, deliver um, weaponry to uh, Ukraine as far as I understand so far, mainly uh, smaller anti-aircraft uh, uh, missiles. Um, but we do not yet have the already mentioned full um, disruption of um, Russian energy exports towards the European Union. And apparently the range of weapons that so far is being um, delivered to Ukraine is not sufficiently wide. and. Um, Maybe there is there are already deliveries that are not public yet. So maybe there's already more going on that we know so far. But what we know so far only concerns anti-tank weapons, smaller anti-tank weapons and smaller anti-aircraft weapons. And what would, of course, be much more effective is to deliver more high-tech, uh, larger, heavier, weapons, perhaps even offensive, uh, or not, not only defensive weapons, um, in order to um, to fight for Ukraine to fight this war. Uh, maybe there is already something like that going on, which is, has not been made public. But uh, so far, the um, these weapons that Germany has delivered are insufficient. Um, they are too, too small um, and uh, they are not yet uh, designed or the, the range of these weapons is not yet sufficient to change the course of the war. And what we need actually are um, the kind of weapons and the mass of weapons and perhaps also um, the expertise um, to uh, to handle and, and operate these weapons. And a scheme I have, I have proposed on Twitter is to not only deliver weapons to uh, Ukraine, but also try and help Ukrainians to recruit uh, um, military vet veterans from the, uh, the armed forces of perhaps not only NATO member countries, but basically of all mem uh, countries of the world who would be then able to uh, operate high-tech weapons. Uh, I wrote there about um, 
fighter planes, apparently the story with fighter planes is more complicated than I thought. Uh, so the entire logistics and uh, the end entire surrounding that uh, the operation of fire f fighter planes needs is apparently quite quite large. But what, what could could imagine something like that with regard to heavier anti-aircraft weapons, uh, larger rockets that would shoot down um, fighter planes, drones, uh, cruise missiles and stuff like that. I hope that this is maybe already inofficially going on. Uh, so what we need here is basically to channel the enormous uh, sympathy and respect uh, and empathy and uh, and feelings that have at least in, in Germany now appeared for Ukraine into into really substantive material action that would not only express itself. Uh, and th so these the sympathy would not only express itself in sort of uh, symbolic actions or humanitarian help, which is also good, of course. But uh, what we need most now is um, heavy sanctions and heavy weaponry, to put it in, in very simple terms. Yes, I Yes, I think um, that is also one of the reasons why I thought actually this scenario that we had in uh, in our little analysis with John Zachau from the Stockholm Center for Eastern European Study, Studies, and which I also mentioned in a number of my publications, which I, that's why I thought it's to be unlikely because exactly Putin has put himself now, dug himself into a hole that uh, he will be have great difficulties getting out uh, and uh, even if he stays in power, if he um, stays alive, let's put it even that way. I think now um, Russia is clearly overstretched. It has clearly uh, now uh, bitten off more than it can chew. And so the uh, this gap between uh, the Russian capabilities and resources on the one side and the Russian ambitions, the foreign ambitions, not only in Ukraine, but also in the Caucasus, in Syria, in Moldova, and so on, um, they are not uh, in line anymore. And I think that will sooner or later express itself in um, in respective um, decisions, which will be very difficult for, for Russia to make, because uh, it cannot simply withdraw now from, let's say, from, uh, from the Southern Caucasus or something like that. So um, I think he is in trouble, um, and unlike other um, analysts, I think that once he goes, uh, by whichever way that happens, uh, I think the um, the regime that he's he has created will crumble. Um, so there, there's another school that says, well, that somebody will basically take his his position, and then the regime can. Uh, perpetuate itself with another leader and you know and they will simply replace him and then it will continue uh, the problem that i see here with that is not that they cannot find uh, a replacement of putin but that there may be uh, several people in the um, upper echelons of the power uh, stratum who think of themselves as actually exactly being this uh, sort of uh, um, second Putin, and uh, that it will be difficult for them to to come to an agreement. Um, why is why would it be difficult for them to come in a, in a to an agreement? The the structure of Russian power is at least within this sort of Putinist regime such that um, it's dangerous to be not on the top, and it's dangerous to be not in the sort of ruling clan. And um, even if you are a sort of part of the ruling elite, uh, you can be in danger. As, for instance, Mikhail Lesin, a former information minister, has learned who was killed in a Washington hotel uh, um, a few years ago, or as uh, um, Alexei Ulyukhaev has learned, who was actually very close to Putin, but who was then put in prison. Um, so. Um, the problem here for the um, sort of Russian politicians that are currently close to Putin is once Putin goes and they themselves do not or their, their clan does not uh, capture the presidency, 
then they will be in danger. Not only uh, will their power be in danger, but they may even be physically in danger and their property may be in danger. And that's why I expect actually a fierce fight for the succession of Putin. I don't think uh, we are there yet where civil society and the political opposition, people like Navalny or Yashin or, um, you know, whoever um, uh, then may come, come up as leader of the Russian opposition will play a role. But um, uh, within the current power structure, it will be actually difficult to determine who exactly then will be su the successor. Because as I said, there may be too many people who think of themselves as being the appropriate successor. And, um, uh, and the question then will be whether they can find an agreement among themselves. If they can find such an agreement, then um, perhaps the regime can perpetuate itself for a while. But even then, I think it will be difficult because now um, the sanctions are uh, so large and um, the image uh, loss of Russia has been so fundamental uh, in the last two weeks that uh, this regime is going to be in trouble no, no matter who is going to be uh, in charge. I know the, the German situation here um, a bit better and what has happened here is that basically until until 24th of February German pacifism has been to the disadvantage of um, Ukraine because um, the annexation of Crimea was uh, largely peaceful um, the um, so-called civil war in eastern Ukraine was sort of perhaps by some recognized it as not a proper civil war, but was not really regarded as a real interstate war. And, and many actually defended the, uh, I think, uh, uh, stupid thesis that this is a civil war. We have now research actually that shows uh, that uh, Russian agents have um, triggered this war and fueled the war and led the separatists um, from the very beginning, not only from later on. Uh, so there, there, there are some, even in the US, there are some scholars who think that Russia only got later, uh, once the allegedly civil war had started, uh, Russia then later got involved uh, in August uh, 2014, when um, the sort of, um, the alleged re rebels got in trouble. In fact, we have now research that shows that Russia has actually, through its irregular agents, uh, not through regular troops like in Crimea, uh, where they had regular troops basically without signs, the so-called green men or little green men. Um, in, in Eastern Ukraine, the situation was different. So there was this sort of um, irregular element, but also this, this irregular group of Igor Girkin was actually directed by the Russian state. So it was actually the Russian state with its agents that has um, triggered uh, the civil war. So that, but, but still the civil war thesis was pretty popular in Germany. And that's why then Germany wanted to prevent a larger war. And that has then often resulted in uh, pressure on Ukraine, yeah, that Ukraine would make compromises that somehow Ukraine should find some agreement with Putin. There was a lot of, of, of criticism already of Putin, but somehow uh, the German pacifism then has played to the disadvantage of Ukraine. But once uh, this real massive attack started, um, uh, open attack, uh, no sort of little green man or something like that, or irregulars or, or no more Girkin or, or these sort of um, uh, dubious um, uh, groups, but just the regular Russian army openly invading Ukraine in a massive attack on the on the capital. That has now meant that German pacifism has turned against Russia and has come to the sort of um, uh, become um, a force uh, to the advantage of Ukraine, and that's why we've seen this uh, shift in German foreign policy um, and. Um, the the agreement of Germany to to sanctions to deliver weapons, um, but still I think there's still sort of something to do. So what we need now is that this um, fortunate for Ukraine shift in German public opinion um, and uh, the sort of mobilization in a strange way of German pacifism to the advantage of Ukraine, because German pacifism now actually means not any longer um, 
supporting Russia or supporting some sort of peace talks. But now actually, the, the, or many German pacifists are acknowledging that uh, Ukraine simply fights for its survival. And that's why they support weapons deliveries. Uh, religious um, groups have, have come to support weapons deliveries. A, a large part of the German left, um, uh, which used to be very, very sort of anti-Ukrainian, I would say, has now come actually out as, you know, re recognizing this as a as a um, as an assault on Ukraine that uh, needs actually a military response and the support for sanctions is now large but that has to be um, the sort of rhetorical and emotional support has to be even better transformed into material action as i said uh, so there's a lot of potential now here uh, in germany i suppose in other nations too uh, to actually um, uh, try to uh, transform that into action and what we need is now basically creative thinking um, as many as possible ideas what one can materially do beyond humanitarian response. So there's a lot of humanitarian help already going on, both for the refugees, but also for Ukraine and for suffering people of Ukraine. But um, humanitarian response is, of course, um, insufficient. We need military responses, economic responses, political responses. And uh, here everybody is sort of encouraged to propose ideas, uh, new approaches and one can at least in germany many of such proposals will now find a fertile so soil an additional um, aspect i think that uh, needs to be brought to the attention also by uh, everybody who supports ukraine is uh, the are the various um, direct basic security threats that are emerging from this war for uh, the European Union and for the European countries of NATO. And I see three threats here. The most obvious one uh, is um, the situation with the nuclear power plants, both with the former nuclear power, power plant of Chernobyl, but also with the active nuclear reactors in Saporizhia, in in Arvodar and in Mykolaiv in Yuzhna Ukrainsk, I think the, well, in the Mykolaiv region, there's also a large uh, nuclear power plant. So, so this is actually, um, these are situations that are directly also a threat uh, to um, uh, European nations. And I think one cannot speak enough about this. And we have already the example of the 1986 uh, Chernobyl accident. If something like that happens in Saporizhia or in Mykolaiv, or if something again happens in Chernobyl, that we will have uh, um, transborder repercussions not only on Ukraine. The second factor is here that um, we have now an enormous, um, uh, already enormous refugee crisis with over 2 million refugees from Ukraine have flown already into um, the European Union. If that continues, then um, uh, basically continental Western Europe will be, uh, could become soon uh, flooded with millions and millions of Ukrainians and may have simply problems uh, sort of uh, taking care of them uh, sufficiently and hosting them and uh, providing uh, living space and, and food and so on, medical support and whatnot. And uh, so this is also a, a very fundamental uh, uh, issue for not only for the European, U uh, not only for Ukraine, but also for the European Union. And there's no physical um, uh, border between the European Union and Ukraine, like there is between Africa and the European Union. Um, and the third factor here is uh, the already much discussed subversion of the logic of the uh, nuclear non-proliferation regime um, through the Russian attack against Ukraine. The, um, the sort of the important thing here is that um, this entire situation that we have now in Eastern Europe is determined, very much determined by um, the fact that uh, Russia has nuclear weapons and Ukraine has no nuclear weapons. And what is the sort of scandalous aspect of all of this is not only that Russia has nuclear weapons, but 
Russia is explicitly allowed to have nuclear weapons under the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty of 1968. Um, so Russia is exempted from the uh, um, general prohibition of uh, the spread of nuclear weapons, can have uh, nuclear weapons as can the US and China and France and Great Britain. Um, and Russia is obviously using its nuclear weapons uh, as a as a threat potential to uh, uh, for conducting its war. It's not yet using nuclear weapons, and I hope it will not use uh, nuclear weapons for the war itself, but it's, it's using the threat of employing nuclear weapons both vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Ukraine and vis-a-vis -vis the West. And on the other hand, Ukraine not only does not have nuclear weapons, but is also forbidden explicitly by the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty to have nuclear weapons. And even more odd in all of this is, of course, that uh, Ukraine once had actually nuclear warheads, nuclear material, nuclear ammunition uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, most of this um, arsenal it could not use, but it could have perhaps sustained a small nuclear force out of this uh, large arsenal that it had um, inherited in the early 1990s from the Soviet Union. And so um, so basically what we have now is an absurd situation in, in that the nuclear non-proliferation regime turns out to be a convenient tool for an official nuclear weapon state, namely Russia, to increase its territory and to attack its neighbors, not only Ukraine, but also Georgia, uh, Moldova, and that is, of course, an absurd situation and basically means that the nuclear non-proliferation regime is um, is invalid or is um, it does not make sense anymore. And that could have wide-ranging implications for world politics in the future because many politicians across the entire world may look at the um, Russian-Ukrainian conflict and they may want to be not as stupid as they may see it as the Ukrainians, but instead they would want to be as smart as the Russians and therefore try to obtain um, nuclear weapons and not uh, follow the logic uh, or the uh, prescriptions of the nuclear non-proliferation regime. That means uh, this is a big factor now um, that could promote the proliferation of nuclear weapons in the future, especially if perhaps sometime in the future there may be a disruptive technology that allows even smaller countries to quickly build nuclear weapons. Currently, this is a technologically rather um, a complicated process, but who knows? Uh, with technological pro process, we might be in, uh, in a few years in a situation in which even smaller countries uh, can easily build a nuclear weapon. And uh, the example of Ukraine and the Russian attack on Ukraine may suggest to them to actually get and build nuclear weapons and or to, to buy them. And then we may uh, end up in a very different world than we are today in.